My name's Dennis Killich. I'll just introduce myself. I joined council late last year, but I'm not new to the region. I've been fortunate enough to marry into the Southern Highlands. I live here and I have family across the district and my mother-in-law's in the crowd as well. So you, you've been warned. I've been trained in town planning and landscape design and, I, and I'm a very keen gardener. And that's what I do on the weekends. And I know you're all very eager to talk about Barrel South straight away. I want to give a broader overview about council, where council's at and, and the story building up to Barrel South. We've heard of the, the international examples from, from Neville and the national all trends. But I like to look at specifically Windsor Caribou Shire, especially our demographics. So I head up strategic outcomes and you're probably thinking, what does that mean? It essentially means strategic, long-term and outcomes, good results. What we mean, and I think you can all appreciate, we don't do long-term planning very well in this country at the local, state and even federal level. My job is not to think about just the next four months, the next four years, it's the next 40 years. The middle of the century is, is what we're planning towards. And strategic outcomes, uh, a division within council, I have the uh, privilege of reporting directly to the general, general manager, which has its challenges, but it's also an opportunity because it's a very lean structure. And, and I'll introduce my team here today in a show of force and visibility. We've got Rachel, Susan, Isabella and Garima here within the strategic outcomes team. And there's only one of me, but my team are very approachable as well. And you're probably wondering, what do we work on in that building up the road? We do a lot more than Barrel South, I can tell you that. I've worked in state government, I've worked in consulting, I've worked across three states, I've never worked this hard in my life. And that's because we're doing probably 10, 15 years worth of reform squished into three years. I'll, I'll run through some of the th work we do within strategic outcomes, but I just want to start on three points. And this applies not just on Barrel South, but everything we do. I believe that everybody in this room starts from a position of love. You love your neighbourhood, you love your street, you, you love your town or village, and you love your neighbours. And anyone proposing to change something down the road can be viewed as a threat, so, so I get it. I'm also here to talk with you, not just at you. And I know that's been an issue in the past. And my third point, I'm gonna be cheeky about this one. I realize council bashing is a national sport in this country. And at Windsor Canterbury, it's an elite sport. I, I get it. Like I said, I was appointed late last year, but I know about the shenanigans of pre-2021. It's easy to tear things down, tear down institutions. I choose to build things, rebuild trust, rebuild institutions, and local government, your council, is an institution. And Windsor Caribou Shire is you. Three quarters of us live here. So strategic outcomes, besides master plans, yes, Barrel South is what we're talking about today, but we also work on village place plans, so the Robertson Place Plan, that's, that's my team. We look after planning proposals or rezoning proposals, and there's no shortage of, of applications. We probably spend most of our time saying no because the community has said you value the green between, and so that requires us to say no to the bad proposals so we can say yes to the strategic ones. Of course, planning certificates, whenever you want to sell your house, planning certificates, my, my team generates... I'm sure you all know the heritage study that's currently undergoing independent peer review, as well as any LEP or DCP amendments, so local environmental plan and development control plan amendments, as well as studies that inform those changes. So you know, where do we stand? And, and I think that's a good gra graphic to just remind us about what we can control and what we can't control. It's probably the cornerstone of Stoic philosophy. Let's focus on what we can control in local government. It's really difficult to change something across the board, across the state. We do need to, and Neville's sort of outlined some of the challenges there. We are one council. We have a powerful voice. I, I don't underestimate the caliber of people in this room and across the Shire and, and the careers and, and adventures you've had to date. But we are local government. 
So we need to focus on what, what we can mould, what we can influence, and what we can change. Like I mentioned, I don't just look at the next few years or the next few months. In Australia, we do think in four or eight year terms. That corresponds to the election cycles. My job at council is to think ahead to 2030, 2040, 2050 plus. And looking at around the room, again, I'm gonna be cheeky. You're gonna say, well, I'm not gonna be around by then. You have a legacy to leave and you have sons and daughters, you have grandchildren. I'm not gonna dive straight into Barrel South. I have to paint the bigger picture. It's not just about Barrel South, it, it's, it is the Winter Caribbee big picture. We are guided by documents and those documents don't just uh, gather dust, they are live documents. So we have the local strategic planning statement, the LSPS, but more importantly, we have our local housing strategy that was adopted in 2021 and it essentially guides where future housing should be. Whenever we're approached, like I said, those planning proposals, rezoning proposals, and some, some weeks we get two or three in a week, and, and Paul Susan has to deal with several requests for rezonings. It doesn't stop. Anyone with a spare paddock wants a rezoning. So if we don't have a strategy, we don't have a mechanism of saying no. Those strategies are informed by the raw data, which is the demographics. There are two undeniable trends. Population increase, ever so modestly in the Winter Caribbean show out. Council's not encouraging growth. Growth is already happening. And I'm gonna, say, I'm gonna be a bit more cheeky and say most of you in this room probably have sons and daughters and grandchildren. We all contributed to, to growth ever so modestly. So the numbers there, compared to Sydney, compared to Wollongong, Illawarra, our numbers are very modest. Nonetheless, we need to plan for it. And the other trend is population change. What I mean by that is we're ageing. And if you look at that graph, we can see a third of us are going to be over the age of 65 by, by the 2040s. We need to plan for this now. And that has implications for housing because at different stages of life, people require different types of housing. To save you reading the whole strategy, there's just two numbers, well, one number really, it's 50-50. It's 50% infill and 50% greenfield or new living areas. And I'll, and I'll explain what I mean by that. We know we need to accommodate Southern Highlanders and, and these are our people, these are your sons and daughters, your grandchildren, 50% within the existing town form so within Barrel, within Mossvale, within Mittagong and the villages. And then the other 50% is new living areas. And we've identified six new living areas. Barrel South is one of them. Again, why Barrel South? We need to look at the, the shire wide picture before we dive into Barrel South. And the big picture is, we did start by looking at the entire shire. So we're going to go through a series of maps in bold text so you can see the, the outline of the Shire. We always start when we're looking at a housing strategy, where are the constraints? And we're going to build the layers here. Red means constraints most likely can't be built on. And bear with me here, we're going to build a strudel or a baklava. We're going to build those layers. So we're within the Sydney water catchment. Those red areas are off the table. The other excluded areas are the um, national parks and nature reserves for uh, obvious reasons. The C2 environmental conservation zone, again, for obvious reasons, the, the, the zone is not appropriate. Slope, building on anything that's sl slope more than 18% gradient is just not feasible. The development industry cannot deliver on that sort of topography and it's more expensive to build on and it makes infrastructure much more expensive to deliver. So generally we exclude anything over 18% gradient. Flood pr prone areas, of course we know the Winter Caribbean River, just to orientate you. Gong, Barrel, Baradu, Mossvale, and in red, the Winter Caribbean River. It's not just about the Winter Caribbean River, but all the riparian corridors, all the creeks that feed into it and feed into other catchments. There's a 40 metre buffer zone around each riparian corridor. And again, 
inappropriate to, to be built upon. And as you can see, the Shire is quite constrained. Mapped heritage items, there's a lot more in there, you just can't see it. If you zoom into the town centres, our, our towns have a lot of heritage items. It doesn't mean you can't develop around heritage, you just need to be more sympathetic. And then conservation areas, again, if we zoomed in, there are a lot more. High Valley agricultural land, I think we have more than this, but in terms of what's mapped on state maps, on statutory maps, that, that's what we can see across the Shire. And then high value vegetation areas, again, inappropriate to be considered for any urban growth. If I overlaid all of that, we get our baklava or strudel out of the oven. That is the big picture. That is the Shire white picture. And I know you might think, oh, I want to see what the data behind each one of that is. We, we've done the work. This is not recent. This is back from 2020, 2021. And it's using both state data, local data, any data we can obtain. The town centres again. Red is a very harsh colour, but let's switch it. Let's look at the green, potentially suitable land. So, so what's left over? Now, that doesn't mean everything that's green on there is suitable. The operative word there is potentially subject to further investigations and constraints analysis. And we did that work. The reason why I'm running through this, even though this was done a few years ago, is because we forget and we sort of focus in on just Barrel South or just Mittagong or just one particular site. When we apply the suitability matrix, we look at access to infrastructure. It's a very unsavoury topic, but I spent half my time talking about sewerage. The, the days of septic tanks are over. Everything has to be sewered. And of course, water, as well as all the other access to amenities and services. So looking at that, we, we've essentially have a three-tiered system there. Most suitable, moderately suitable, least suitable. Again, very constrained, but there are a few green areas we can see around the town centres. And, and you might think, oh, but there's probably a bit of land available away from the town centres. This council barely is able to service existing villages and towns. That's why there's very little appetite for new villages in the middle of a paddock. It is extremely expensive and extremely uneconomical to build new villages from scratch in the middle of a paddock. So if we zoomed in, and it's, it's blurry, so the, re, the, the area we're zooming into is barrel. If we zoom into it, we've got the centre of barrel there, Baradu, and in green, we have barrel south. And I appreciate there's a bit of green further to the north, but the community has always said we value the green between. If we expand any further north, we will break down that green between, between Mittagong and Barrel. So to summarise, why the Barrel South new living area? And Barrel South is, is, is a working title. I'll come to it because there's, there's history to that word. It's in the adopted local housing strategy. And we always say to developers and, and, and investors who approach us with those planning proposals, like I discussed, if it's not in the strategy, we're not gonna look at it. So we're guided by the strategy. I'm not saying it's beyond reproach. We, we review those strategies every five years. Like I said, the population is growing ever so modestly compared to other council areas. And our population is changing, aging. The great thing about the Barrel South, our new living area, the identified area, is that there's an opportunity for a small village centre. It, it, it's an opportunity that we missed in East Barrel, or we tried and, and it um, didn't eventuate, but we're trying to do things differently. So we're learning from the past and we don't want to make the mistakes of the past. And of course, infrastructure. Neville touched on Chelsea Gardens, Kumanji, rebranded as Ashbourne. I drive past it every day, and the infrastructure outcome can never happen again. And, and it's my job not to allow that to occur ever again. We know the Barrel STP is being, being upgraded, and there is sewer capacity, and that is why Barrel South New Living Area has been chosen to be, to, to be master planned, led by council, uh, with community, to go first. There's, there's um, six new living areas. And of course, proximity 
to existing amenities and services. Just a quick project timeline. You probably, if you've had a bit of a look at our Participate Winter Caribbee uh, website, this project has been humming since last year. It does take time to get the technical due diligence reports, as well as carry out those early uh, community design workshops, which occurred uh, last year. Now we're very much about that broader community consultation. This is all pre-exhibition, pre-formal public consultation. And most councils don't do this. It is best practice to, to consult upfront before something is formalised and council gives you 28 days to put in a submission. We're months ahead of that and we're months, if not years, away from a rezoning. This is about upfront consultation now. Finally, Barrel South. So again, we're gonna build the strudel, we're gonna build the baklava, the layers. We start with the constraints. Constraints don't necessarily mean you can't build on it. It means, can you celebrate that constraint? And, and we'll run through it together. So just to orientate you, we've got East Barrel here, Burradu, Erridge Park Road, that's the roundabout, the, the Southern Highlands Botanic Gardens, and Kangaloon Road. Southern Highlands Christian School, Pepperfield, and that's Boardman Road south. And of course, the Winter Caribbean River. What we have there is just a study area, so building the layers. We know where the heritage conservation areas and heritage items are, as well as we know that Park Road and, and Old South Road, the alignment is heritage listed. Um, and there's also what's not shown on here is the potential heritage, which is currently in the draft heritage study, undergoing independent peer review. Again, we know what those are. It's Harvey, so European heritage, as well as First Nations heritage, a scar tree and a potential midden. Looking at the ecological constraints, again, we know where they are. They're, they're, they primarily follow the, the riparian corridors. Again, I'm, I'm building up to it, uh, as well as the, the perimeter planting. Even though this is a very altered landscape, it's been farmed for years, it, it, it is a highly altered landscape, but nonetheless, what's been planted over the years by local landowners has created medium and high ecological constraints. I, I call them opportunities because the trees are already there. And often in new developments, what do you look for? The trees. So if we can keep some of that, it'll be excellent. And of course, the big one, flooding. We know where the floodplain is. There's a misconception, a very broad one, that the whole site is flood prone. It is simply not. It's not based in fact. We know where the floodplain is. It is primarily south, the southern bank. We know where the riparian corridors are, three of them which pass through the site. Again, constraints, but also opportunities. I'll just point one example out. That's a straight line right down there. There are no straight lines in nature. It's obviously a constructed stormwater line. There's an opportunity to reconstruct riparian corridors and reconstruct wetlands. And we have opportunities there to embrace the landscape and not just view it as a constraint. And bushfire. I know red is a very harsh colour and you think, who, who built in Baradu with all that? We planted the trees and, and it automatically becomes mapped as bushfire prone. We are in a town setting, so I'm not too concerned about bushfire. I'll come back to these maps in a second. So we know what the constraints are, which are also opportunities, but what are we guided by? Neville touched on what is possible, what can be achieved, but also we're on the cutting edge here. We're also challenging what the industry delivers, what I like to call lazy development. So we're led by the urban design principles. I like to call it town design principles because I think urban people automatically think of Sydney or Wollongong. I want to build bring it back to the provincial scale. These principles were developed in consultation with the community as part of the community design workshops last year. And I'd like to have uh, more of those workshops. But the first principle being a compact town centered around a village. The other, ensuring that the village center is well located so we don't make the mistakes of the past where a village center 
the, the local supermarket or grocer fails as it did in East Barrel. I always like to say that there's a science and an art to town planning. So we're informed by the science of it, the engineering, the constraints analysis, the due diligence technical reports, as well as the art of it. Not just architects or, or urban designers or town planners, but also the community input. Again, I want to talk with you, not at you. A lot of these principles are universal and we're not reinventing something. These are good old fashioned British town planning principles. Opening up riverfront to public ownership. At the moment, none of it is publicly accessible. Ensuring that the village centre facilitates an active and vibrant centre. Again, it goes to the idea around having some residential near the village in the form of, for example, townhomes and dual occupancies. And of course, the social neighbourhood. The idea of having a footpath and a veranda only a few metres apart. We've, we've forgotten how to do this. Our developers, with respect, do not deliver this. They deliver the stock standard template and you can copy and paste it no matter where you are. I think this has huge implications for the Winter Caribbean Shire community. It's looking at our demographics, again, I'm often driven by the data and the projections. Our population is changing. We are getting older. We're also isolated and loneliness is a huge issue. Often we focus on the physical health. Let's think about the mental health as well. Having social neighbourhoods, you know, that could be the social interaction that person on the veranda has all day and it makes all the difference. And of course, looking at residential density and having a variety of, of housing. When I say density, we're not talking about skyscrapers. We're talking about housing diversity. So townhomes, dual occupancies, rather than just, with respect, a trophy home on acreage. We have plenty of those in the Southern Highlands. The orientation of streets, again, these are things our developers have, with respect, have forgotten about. You can orientate the streets and blocks so that everybody gets morning light, midday light, and you're shielded by the harsh western sun using, for example, the existing tree plantings, as well as ensuring, you know, if we are going to have density and have rear laneways, we need to make sure that the, the courtyards have solar access. And of course, local character. It's not just about architecture. It's, it's the feeling of a place, dare I say, the vibe of the place, and responding to the regional vernacular. And that's just a very fancy way of saying traditional architecture. And from what I've seen, some of the workshops I've attended, people do not respond to, I was trained in, in design and architecture, I do love a good flat-roofed glass building, but I know it's not for the Southern Highlands. So when we say local character, it's not just about the gable roof or the weatherboard uh, cladding, it's, it's the whole thing. It's, it's how the, the village can function as well as the materiality. And of course, access to open spaces. So the reason why council engaged consultants to look at the Barrel South area is because we're a very lean team and it's a huge area. 12 separate landowners. And usually what happens when you have 12 separate landowners Again, with respect to landowners, they don't often talk to each other. So you get 12 disparate master plans. Council said, let's lead from the front. Let's have one cohesive master plan to plan for the next few decades. And we're, like I said, we're led by the science and art of town planning. And this is some of the science, the due diligence reports, the ecological investigations, the heritage, the bushfire, the traffic and retail needs analysis. We can have a whole workshop on each one. I just want to focus on the village centre because that's been the missed opportunity in developments in the past, including East Barrel and Retford Park. A small village centre is viable. I have two economic consultants who are nationally recognised who confirm the numbers. We looked at the catchment area. It's an awful map because it doesn't really correspond to anything we know. That's Barrel there traditional town centre on Long Street. That's south. The primary catchment area includes East Barrel, parts of Baradu, and the emerging South Barrel area, as well as extending into Glen Quarry and Kangawoon. So we know there's a catchment there. And anecdotally, when you speak to people on the ground who live in East Barrel, they want to be able to walk to the shops. You can't do that all the way into Bong Long Street. The idea here is a small village centre. Again, 
the operative word is small. I don't want this turning into a shopping centre. And we, we have the planning controls for that. So when I say local, local services, I really do mean milk and bread. In East Barrel, the uh, Scottish Arms Hotel is great, but you can't do your groceries there. And, and we do have the catchment for, for an emerging village centre. If we look at what is the viability sort of matrix, how do you create a village centre with, with an anchor supermarket and shops? Well, it's, it has to be anchored by a supermarket, otherwise it falls apart. Now, I'm just going to say a few, but it, it doesn't have to be one of these. It could be an independent grocer, it could be Coles, it could be Woolies, it could be IGA, it could be Drake's from South Australia. It has to be anchored by a supermarket. And I'm agnostic about who it is. As well as we need to get the location right and there has to be a catchment area. Now, the numbers stack up when we have 2,000 dwellings at South Barrel, as well as leaning on East Barrel and Baradu. There's, of course, non-retail tendencies, food specialties, you know, your local takeaway shops, as well as a local GP practice, a dentist, allied health. So who have we heard from thus far? So I want to hear a lot more from you. Like I said, I view everybody in this room and the community groups I've met to date as mentors. I want to speak with you, not just at you. Our online survey is open. We need to hear a lot more. We have engaged in landowner consultations, and this is part of the transparency. We are proposing something that's on private land, so we do need to consult with landowners. That being said, I am landowner agnostic. The, the master plan is not informed by what landowner A or landowner B or landowner C says or thinks. It's led by the science and art of town planning and I won't be pressured otherwise. And it's your job to keep the future councillors in line as well on that. We're not lobbyists for developers or, or landholders. We're at a community forum, local community groups. I've been speaking to Windsor, I've been speaking to the Friends of Barrel. I'm, I'm open to meet anybody and everybody. There is only one of me, so please speak to my team as well. Now, Garamo is the project manager and she's been looking after this project since day one. And of course, the community design workshops, that's where we workshop the design principles as well as the emerging land use plans that I'm, that I'm about to show, and it's also on our website. Just quickly, what we've, what we've heard so far, I haven't been surprised by what I've heard so far. I know about flooding. We know exactly where the, 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 the floodplain is. We know what the, where the riparian corridors are. People want quality open space. And, and you know, we're, we're having this uh, conversation at the moment looking at Ashbourne, just a very quick tangent. Open space can't always be on flood prone land. It has to be quality open space that's flood free. So riparian corridors are great for detention basins to slow the, the, the stormwater down, let it soak into the soil, feed the plants and trees. But that doesn't mean that's the only open space we get. We've done this pretty well in Retford Park and parts of East Barrel, but we can do better. And I'm a landscape designer. My whole focus is on the open space and the quality of open space we get over the next few decades. So this is why I was building up to it. So these are available on the website. I'll run through it, but there's a lot on there. So we started with options. We have to have options. We need to explore every option we can, and it's part of the design process. Often architects, designers, town planners talk about the iterative design process, and this is part of it. And at first they look the same. It's really about where the village centre can work, the viability of the village centre, because that's the test for success here, the village centre and the, the uh, public open space, the green space. So option one, where we looked at the village centre being on the corner of Eridge Park Road and Kangaloon Road. Option two was an inbound uh, village centre, uh, uh, well within Barrel South. And the other option was on the corner of Kangaloon Road and Boardman Road South, opposite the Southern Highlands Christian School. Now we tested each one rigorously through those workshops, as well as the information coming through those technical due diligence reports. Where we're probably heading is towards option one, because the retail needs assessment has, has been very clear, we need visibility. We need to pass it. Uh, we need to capture that passing trade. 
on Erridge Park Road and Kangolin Road. I like to call this option the Botanic Village because it's opposite the Southern Highland Botanic Gardens. And before you jump at me and say, what is that massive purple blob on the riverfront? I'm with you. That has been my primary critique to our consultant urban designer, is that we need that continuous open space along the riverfront. And what you can't see is purple was thought of as large lot residential. So because it's flood prone, that's really land in private ownership, but the houses would be up on, up on the road there. So these are options that they're land use plans and that's why they look quite blobby. And that's why everything's a dotted line. Everything's a draft, everything's subject to change, depending on, like I said, that science and art of town planning, and you're, you're the artist. But we'll come, to, come back to this map. So you know, next steps, we're engaging in that broader community consultation. Again, all pre-exhibition, before we enter that formal process. We've met community groups, I think within days of being appointed late last year, my calendar was chock-a-block full with people who want to talk about all projects, including Barrow South, so we've been meeting non-stop. We will have more consultation sessions and information sessions after Easter. I do need a bit of a break, to be, to be honest, and of course, participate Winter Winter all this information is on that platform. The technical due diligence reports are continuing, and there's an emerging master plan that I'd like to share at another forum. And ultimately, the formal public exhibition process towards the middle of the year. We'll have those drop-in sessions, the online surveys, as well as the, the formal feedback, the formal submissions. Most councils really just do the minimum. And the alternative to this process, a council and community-led master plan, the alternative to this isn't no growth. The alternative to this is a developer-led master plan times 12, because there's 12 separate landowners. That is why council stepped in and say, we need one cohesive master plan led with the community. So you know, imagery of what Barrow South Village could look like. Again, that's a working title. I looked into some of the history of Barrow South. It has quite an interesting history. Besides the, the history doesn't just mean heritage items. It also means people, what happened there. They were actually uh, thought of as, on the linen plan from 1829, they were veterans blocks. So you know, there's the history, perhaps Barrel South is not the best term for that emerging uh, new village. There might be something more appropriate and speaks to the history of the site. There's also an airfield there a bit behind Erich Park Road and you can't see it because it's hidden by a ridge line. But it's quite interesting and the airfield was used during the 1978 Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting. So th there is some history there which is important and which can be incorporated into the master plan through interpretive signage and interpretive landscape features. I know that you've already seen some of the imagery about what housing could look like. We already have East Barrel and just about the typology, the, the housing diversity there is almost wow. zero. East Barrel is a beautiful place to bring up a family, but it's the same housing product. And I don't like describing housing as products, that's what, it's consultant language, but nonetheless, it's, a, it's, it's built as though we're all at the same stage of life. Mum, dad, two kids. I can look at, around the, the room and looking at our demographics led by the data, we're not all mum, dad and two kids. We've changed. So I'm open to questions.